Uh, welcome uh, to Forum West, third day of uh, deliberations, and uh, warm welcome also to um, our digital visitors, whether at home at the um, at the computer desks or um, in uh, spill-out room that we offer to those of you <laughs> who could not enter this room. There are a few free seats, so um, six free seats. Karin, could you please open the door and help us uh, let some people in? Maybe I'll ask Ben, maybe you can help us because it's the security of the house that we follow. Please, there are seats here in front available. And there, there is one. And there, somewhere. Please join us. I apologize for a slight delay, and uh, welcome again um, to the second current uh, in the context of this Berlin sequence of Form West project, where we gather around documents, constellations, and prospects to debate um, art production, um, dissem dissemination, and reception of art in the context of contemporary moments, um, which um, undeniably uh, put um, under pressure, put under question some basic assumptions about society, politics, economics, and certainly also uh, of our own field of artistic practice. Now, in the parallel to, uh, parallel to, thank you, in the parallel to two currents of learning plays and dissident knowledges, uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday, we engaged uh, with some questions around the, question, uh, around the notion of art production as uh, in a strand current conceptualized and ho hosted by philosopher uh, and um, uh, writer uh, Boris Groys, where we uh, pondered um, upon the notion of a function of art as a place um, of labor. Now from here today we shift to the, to the questions around infrastructure and um, it is a strand uh, conceptualized and hosted by uh, Iri Drogov, who has been one of the um, most inspiring uh, people, professionals for us in the field, uh, in, the, in the project uh, Form West. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, the, the whole strand is conceptualized by Irit, who has invited a number of artists, theorists, um, uh, to discuss these issues and develop by free thought, which is a loose collaborative platform for research, pedagogy, and production based in uh, London. Now, Irit prob probably does not need to be introduced uh, to our audiences. She's a theorist, curator, and professor of visual culture at Goldsmith, 
whose practice deals with geography, globalization, and contemporary participatory practices in the expanded field of art. Um, in regards to the subject of infrastructure, she has reminded us uh, um, repeatedly, actually, that it is precisely this subject of inquiry that we need to look at when she writes. I quote, when we in the West or in the industrialized, technologized, country, uh, technologized countries congratulate ourselves on having an infrastructure, functioning institutions, systems of classification and categorizations, archives and traditions and professional training for these, funding and educational pathways, excellent criteria, impartial juries and properly air-conditioned um, big enough auditoria, with good acoustics, that works, etc. We forget that the, uh, we forget the degree to which these have become protocols that bind and confine us in their demand to be conserved or in their demand to be resisted. Now, for the discourse uh, at play here this week, and uh, of course for thinking through what is to come. We understand uh, that the subject of infrastructure is one of which we must be aware and inquisitive in our desire to forego the endorsements of the past in favor of prospects that uh, embrace that which we do not know yet. And with this, we would like to open um, and inaugurate um, what uh, necessarily will be an ongoing series of conversations, discussions, and negotiations and I would like to ask you to join me in welcoming Eri Drogov. Hello, everyone. Thank you to Buck and um, the team and House of World Cultures and the team for um, giving us the, the space and the wherewithal to launch this particular discussion. I need to take responsibility for the crowding situation. Um, it was I who insisted on a small room uh, against everybody's advice. And probably they were right and I was wrong. Um, but the reason I insisted was that this is an extremely speculative beginning of a discussion. We have some thoughts we want to put forward, um, but it's not a kind of declamatory performative situation in which we're really in charge of what um, we want to, to sort of say here. And so it seemed much more productive to be in a small, more intimate space, which would allow for discussion. So this is my apology, and it's really meant for those people who are outside. As Maria mentioned, um, this has been developed by um, a group of colleagues. We operate very loosely under the umbrella of free thought. This is sort of our second outing. Um, we tried to do something together in Graz at Steyrische Herbst um, in the art and activism um, concentration there in September. And um, some of the members of, of Free Thought are with us here today. And um, we'll, we'll just introduce people as they come up rather than in advance and then you'll forget you know, who's who and what's what. And, um, the, the order of things is that we'll have two small presentations today, um, then a discussion amongst four of us who are here, um, then another two presentations and another discussion tomorrow, and then we've invited um, several practitioners um, who are going to um, do the second part of the presentations tomorrow afternoon, and together this is the exploration of, of infrastructure. Why infrastructure? Why a term so unloved and so unlovely? Why a term central to technocratic efficiency? Why a term that focuses on the making of something possible rather than on the thing itself? 
why a concept that on the face of it seems void of significant critical potential. A term largely captive by planning discourse. It is seen as the ultimate mode of technical organizational support delivery. Sewage, energy, capital flow, traffic, transportation, food, arms, are seemingly the building blocks of contemporary geodemographic organization. Is there a potential to think this model of efficient delivery critically? To introduce both subjectivity and incoherence into its working? Can what Raymond Williams famously referred to as structure of feeling be thought as an infrastructure of feeling? Over the next couple of days, we will poke at this term with different sticks, moving from management studies to urbanism to performance to the post-colonial world. We will be joined by several practitioners who will begin explorations of how to identify and make manifest a set of hidden infrastructures that are not identified as such. We're hoping that this is the beginning of a long-term project that will culminate in an exhibition dedicated to turning inside out a much unloved concept, making it turn away from efficiency and towards incoherence. This is a de facto attempt to recast infrastructure as an A-signifying practice. And it's much more difficult than I could have foreseen. I should say at the outset that for me, the interest in infrastructure is to a large extent part of the struggle of trying to figure out how to work. And so and I think that um, it's, it's sort of very important for me as a practice to sort of, of not separate, let's say, a subject from the sort of methodological or kind of, of processes that it opens up for me. So it, it's, it's kind of the subject is never isolated from the kind of processes that it kind of, of makes possible. So for me, the interest in infrastructure is to a large extent part of the struggle of trying to figure out how to work how to move away from subjects or themes or materials that have been legitimated as such by disciplinary discourses, trying to move away from existing categories of what and how we know, and trying to move away from expertise as such. This abdication of expertise in favor of some form of inhabitation of stage, knowledge, and sound. I've recently encountered in a series of projects by the Belgian choreographer and dancer, Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher, um, where over the past two years, she has been sort of, of staging a series of encounters with her desire to operate in relation to canonical sounds, canonical scripts, canonical protocols, uh, and failing to do so miserably because the, the kind of, of what she's producing is the crisis that what she's able to do is not up to what she needs to do. And so the, the sort of, of the expertise in choreography, the expertise in dance, the expertise in, in music is not up to the kind of declarative modality that we, she wishes to have in relation to these. So this, this encountered in the work of, of someone like Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher has been exceptionally moving from some, for someone like me who does intellectual work, in particular because it was not a withdrawal an exit, a named failure. 
Rather, it was a statement that the proficiencies that we have are not up to the task, that we are not defined by them, that they are interchangeable, that the drive to engage is far more important than the ability to achieve. But none of these mean for one moment that one evacuates the stage. It is an instance of a signifying knowledge as Guattari longed for, knowledge or proficiency that perform an incoherence, a suspension, the opposite of what is expected of them, but nevertheless means. The moves seem very clearly to me to have been from categories to processes and entangled processes that cannot be divided and named at that. In the concept of infrastructure, I find such a set of processes in which the conceptual, material, and procedural rub against one another, not able to maintain either their discursive or instrumental purity. So in this struggle to find ways to work that are not going to reproduce what we already know how to know, infrastructure seems to hold forth some promise. This discussion, as we've said, has been conceptualized by free thought, which is a loose convergence of thinkers and doers, most of them based in London, but not exclusively, who are interested in ways in which ideas migrate from research-intensive environments into other arenas, morphing and changing in the process. Our moment is characterized by an ever-widening gap between institutions of political governance elected on the basis of policies, reformist visions, notions of social justice, or, conversely, on the basis of smiles, charisma, and false promises, depending on your point of view. And the gap I'm talking about between economic and financial infrastructure, such as the IMF, the World Bank, the credit rating agencies, the European Central Bank, etc., who are perceived as ideologically neutral infrastructure that enables financial management within the far reach of globalized economies. The gap is extremely interesting to me, a set of alibis not dissimilar from the role of the UN in the early post-war years of the Cold War. Moving quite a bit further than questions about regulation and deregulation, the financial infrastructure that governs the globe today has a complex multi-layered relation with governance and accountability. Therefore, the language of politics, as we know, cannot be applied to both its critique or a resistance to it. The degree to which infrastructure is deployed is either pure instrumentality or is a comforting panacea of assured Western standards of efficiency, communication, mobility, and subservience to econo economist arguments is truly alarming. If you watch CNN, which only, you only do if you spend time in hotel rooms, if you watch CNN, you will have seen that infrastructure is the quintessential selling point for capital investments. National advertising campaigns tell us that Uzbekistan or Armenia or Malaysia have beautiful landscapes, usually an image, <laughs> friendly people, usually an image, and considerable investment in infrastructure, usually no image, or one of um, an air-conditioned office block with computer terminals. Obviously, part of this is the language of global flattening in which safety and familiarity have to be introduced. The promise of adventures with incomprehensible eccentric indigenous populations is probably not going to cut it as advertising for international business investment. Nevertheless, the relation between infrastructure looked at culturally 
and its ability to become the locus of asignification and incoherence is one of the drives behind my desire to look at this topic. How to think knowledge away from assurance is parallel to how to think infrastructure away from delivery. As Simon O'Sullivan has argued, for Deleuze and Guattari, an asignifying rupture is a process by which the rhizome resists territorialization or attempts to signify or name it by an overcoding power. It is the process by which the rhizome breaks out of its boundaries, deterritorialization, and then reassembles or recollects itself elsewhere and else when re-territorialization, often assuming a new or shifted identity. In the classroom, asignifying ruptures are those processes students employ to avoid being just students, that classrooms use to avoid being just classrooms, that content uses to avoid being just subject matters, and the teachers use to avoid being just teachers. A signifying ruptures are those various processes by which rhizomes proliferate, wallow, accrete, spread, shatter, and reform, disrupt into play, seeming chaos or anarchy. So the process by which knowledge assumes a significatory forms is one that destabilizes its relation to other fixed knowledges and acquires an affective surplus. And one of the things that I'm interested in is the possibility of thinking affective surplus in relation to infrastructure, whether that is something that one could kind of all plot out. So can infrastructure be subject to a set of A-signifying ruptures that might allow it to become more than delivery. Now, speaking for myself, this initial interest in infrastructure has come from several different directions. Three, to be precise, I think. One is an, an intellectual interest in the possibility of taking a seemingly pragmatic facilitating mode and turning it into a questioning critical entity. And that is, of course, the concern of many artists um, working today. I'm thinking of Ursula Biman, Angela Melitopoulos, Rax, media collective, numerous self-organized education and research projects, and many, many others. So initially, this, this interest in the possibility of, of taking a pragmatic, facilitating mode and turning it into a kind of critical questioning one. So that's, that's one set of interests. The second is an interventionist interest in how to enter and operate within public cultural institutions in ways that use their infrastructure while also laying it bare or attempting to recast it for other purposes than those the institution is ostensibly dedicated to. So one of the things that's been extremely interesting in the last decade about um, sort of, of activist artistic practices, interventionist artistic practices, self-organized artistic practices, and their um, propensity for mimicking structures, for entering the, the discussion through a kind of mimicking process of structures has been precisely the kind of ability to lay bare the, the, what the infrastructure is ostensibly aimed at and what it could possibly be made to do, not in terms of delivering something else, but in terms of projecting backwards on itself and making things kind of, of, of more apparent. And thirdly, a necessary critical recognition that one of the primary conceits of the West is its superior infrastructure. 
its capacity for infrastructural thought, by which is meant that how things are going to come about is as central as what they are, who is involved, what energies, vitalities, and desires they bring into the arena, why this might be urgent or important, etc. <coughs> Obviously, these are the logics of the market. But they have moved seamlessly into cultural institutions with very little questioning. The emphasis on institutional infrastructures that we see in Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, and across East Asia exemplifies this privileging of the functioning structural over any other category of critical thought that we might associate with cu cultural activity. Recently, within the context of a small conference on what is the post-colonial exhibition, I heard the director of Tate Modern produce a triumphalist account of the numbers of visitors, users, purchasers the museum had recently made. It turned out that his understanding of the issue at hand what is the post-colonial exhibition, of trying to think what a post-colonial exhibition might actually be, had to do with Tate looking at their collection and recognizing that it had certain gaps in it. Gaps being apparently an unacceptable thing. Subsequent to this realization, they have resolved the problem by going on an international shopping spree to fill these gaps. Most objectionable of all is that the shopping spree has been financed by wealthy collectors from these cultural gaps who have been persuaded of the importance of work from their home countries being part of the collections and cultural infrastructure of one of the West's most glitzy institutions. Within the world of cultural practices, we think of infrastructure as enabling. We think that it is an advantageous set of circumstances through which we might achieve an equal playing field, redress the wrongs of the world, and redress the balance of power within a post-slavery, post-colonial, post-communist world of endless war. This redress is always a binding of representation enfolded within the structures of a seemingly dignifying, seemingly enabling infrastructure. We see this across a broad spectrum, whether this be an inclusion of a discussion of slavery in the protocols of the UN, I'm referring to the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance that took place in Durban in 2001, or the inclusion of a neglected and invisible artistic tradition, such as art from the Arab world, into the schedule of an august Western institution, such as the Museum of Modern Art. Um, an exhibition called Without Boundary, 17 Ways of Looking, that took place in New York in 2006. But whatever the position, there is a sense that the incorporation of this work into the ultimate infrastructure, political, cultural, or technocratic, that ignored its very existence for so long, is a benchmark. A contested one, but definitely a benchmark of achievement, of a seeming change in attitudes. What if, however, the concept of infrastructure was thought against the grain of inclusion, enablement, and achievement, and became the site of a critical investigation of the frictions that take place between expression and organization. One of the, the reasons that um, 
I'm interested in, in infrastructure, has to do with, as I said before, um, this seems to me to be a site of entangled processes that cannot um, be easily aligned with sort of named ethical positions. And so there's a kind of, within infrastructure, there's a kind of rubbing together of things that contaminate one another and can't be separated easily into strands that can be named, you know, acceptable progressive practice and um, unacceptable regressive kind of, 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 of technocratic practice. And it's, it's that entanglement and contamination that seem really very interesting. But the other is sort of trying to think about contemporaneity as infrastructure. Um, the, the sort of, of trying to characterize contemporaneity um, in terms of the kind of insights that we might be able to, to um, get from infrastructure. In our department at the university, we often say that our subject is contemporaneity and that this is not a historical period or a set of contemporary materials. Rather, we think of contemporaneity as a series of affinities with contemporary urgencies and the ability to access them in our work. Such an understanding of contemporaneity is equally significant for the curatorial, demanding that it finds ways of conceptually entering contemporary urgencies rather than commenting upon them or taking them up as subject matter. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping um, that I'm sort of, of able to to uh, make clear that one of the seductions of infrastructure is the fact that it's virtually impossible for it to translate into a subject, right? That it's always a, a sort of set of, of, of uh, processes that are in, in, in tension uh, with one another with their rhetoric of enablement and, and so on. So the, the impossibility of taking them up as subject matter, the endless exhibitions about terrorism or a globalized art world we have endured in recent years, being a case in point. But not only is contemporaneity about the engagement with the urgent issues of the moment we are living out, but more importantly, it is the moment in which we make those issues our own that is, the process by which we enter the contemporary. So, finally, I would like to put forward a really tentative argument that's not fully or deeply worked out yet about the relation of our expanding field to infrastructure and about this conjunction's central importance to the understanding of contemporaneity. When Okuyen Wezor was curating Documenta 11, he said again and again, in an effort to ward off the constant tedious questions about which artists were going to be included in the show, etc., that it is a lesser matter precisely which artists or works he would be including, but rather which archives we would be able to read them out of. His efforts to privilege the archives and the reading strategies at our disposal have stayed with me as really important principles of contemporaneity. When we in the West or in the industrialized, technologized countries congratulate ourselves on having an infrastructure, properly working institutions, systems of classification and categorization, archives and traditions and professional training for these, funding pathways and educational pathways, excellence criteria, impartial juries and properly air-conditioned auditoria with well-stocked cafes. We forget the degree to which these have become protocols that bind and confine us in their demand to be conserved or conversely in their demand to be resisted. Following Michel Ferrer, thinking about the impact of NGOs as modes of counter-governmental organization, 
the shift from consumers to stakeholders has significantly shifted our understanding of infrastructures. From properly functioning structures that serve to support something already agreed upon, the necessity, the desirability, the, the, the um, um, superiority of certain kinds of cultural values, the institutions that sustain them, etc., that support something already agreed upon, to the recognition of ever greater numbers of those who have a stake in what they contribute to or benefit from. Much of the more activist-oriented work within the art field has taken the form of reoccupying infrastructure, using the spaces and technologies and budgets and support staff and recognized audiences in order to do something quite different, not to reproduce, but to reframe questions. We think of infrastructure as enabling. We think it is an advantageous set of circumstances through which we might redress the wrongs of the world. When MoMA in New York gets around to putting up the particular exhibition of contemporary Arab art I was talking about, it is either celebrated as a great step against Islamophobia or derided as the co-optation of such work into hegemonic systems of market patronage. But whatever the position, there is a sense that the incorporation of this work within an august context into the ultimate artistic infrastructure that ignored its existence for so very long is a benchmark, a contested benchmark, but definitely a benchmark. So if we keep in mind Ashil Mbembe's question, is the edge of the world a place from which to speak the world? as opposed in this instance to being a place that can emulate the convenience and seeming seamless flow of the center, we might reflect about what the absence of infrastructure does make possible, which is to rethink the very notion of platform and protocol to put in proportion the elevation of individual creativity to further the shift from representation to investigation. So and this is not in any way a romantic plea for conditions without infrastructure. But I think that um, what gets done without infrastructure has the sort of possibility of casting the dynamics in a very different way. And it's something that I would want to kind of keep workingly engaged with. Thinking about the links between collectivity and infrastructure, because collectivity is one of the things that enables things to take place when there is an absence you know, of superb infrastructure. So thinking about the links between collectivity and infrastructure, the obvious necessities of mobilizing as many resources and expertises as possible at a given moment in order to not only respond to the urgencies of that moment, but also in the need to invent the means invent the protocols, invent the platforms, which will make that engagement manifest among strata of stakeholders. Then the decentering of the West is not the on only the redress of power within a post-slavery, post-colonial, post-communist world, but also the opportunity and the absence of infrastructure to think, to rethink the relations between resources and manifestations. In order to understand the potential of a particular condition, we do not mythologize or romantically glorify it, but rather extract from it a revised set of relations. From Tucuman Arde to Colectivo Situaciones, from Stodelat to Rax Media Collective to Carita, from public movement to public school, from Oda Proiesi to Ex Urban. These shifts 
have and are occurring all around us. And while I would not claim that they are a model to be reproduced, sort of, of an attempt to take a set of particular conditions and reproduce them in that kind of romantic way, within far more privileged conditions, I would suggest that they are the archive from which we need to read our own activities. Thank you. So, um, as I said, as I said before, um, this is just this is just kind of the beginning of a project. Uh, we have over today and, and tomorrow um, six presentations, um, and after each small group of presentations, what we'd like is to kind of begin a conversation amongst ourselves and with you, trying to unpack these terms. Um, so I would like to invite my colleague um, Stefano Harney um, to do the next presentation. Stefano teaches at Singapore Management University, previously um, was one of a heroic group of people at Queen Mary University in London who set up um, a critical management school that devoured itself. Uh, he's the author, with Fred Moten, amongst many other things, of The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study. So I'd like to invite Stefano to um, present his thoughts around infrastructure. Then we take a short break, and then there'll be four of us trying to kind of unpack this, hopefully, with your help.